Good afternoon, viewers. Welcome to the special DPI program as we continue our coverage of Budget 2019. I'm joined this afternoon by the Honorable Minister of Citizenship, Winston Felix. Good afternoon, Minister, and welcome to the program. Thank you very much for having me on this program. Now, Minister, your, um, sec your department has been allocated some $1.6 billion in the 2019 budget. Of course, there are a lot of programs that have already started that will be continued into 2019. If you would permit, permit me, let's talk about the construction of new passport offices. How would this um, allocation help you in this process? First of all, let me take you back to 2015, when many of you would have experienced either through news reports on the television or in the newspaper, of large gatherings of persons outside of the Ivleri office the Central Immigration and Passport Office. People queuing up there from five, early in the morning, lines running from the office still around to Bark Street. And some people would have been lucky to get through, even though they've been in the line for almost the entire working day. Um, this became a very intolerable situation and the president had called me and said, well, we have to fix this situation. So having looked at it, it two things came to mind. One, improve the efficiency of the department and decentralize. Because I deliberately took a day and interviewed persons in the um, Immigration and Passport Office. And what I found that most of the persons there came from the quarantine or other parts of Barbies, some from Linden, some from Essequibo. And that urged the decentralization process. We started in Barbies. We started in Springlands, as a matter of fact. The search for space um, commenced in Springlands. But all the areas we looked at were unsuitable or claimed by other government departments. Uh, we came to New Amsterdam and we found the place where the office is now located. And then we went to Linden. We found Linden. The truth is, space has been identified in New Amsterdam, Linden, Anna Regina, Bartico. And let them. The offices in New Amsterdam and um, Linden, they have been completed, but we are waiting for some connectivity issues to be sorted out by GTT. Once that has been sorted out in the, at the two locations, I anticipate that between the 15th of December and the 1st of January, we should be occupying. But that does not say that the decentralization has not commenced. We have done some renovation to the police headquarters, and so the decentralization in New Amsterdam is going on as we speak, but not in the right accommodation. Linden, we had borrowed space from the NIS, and that decentralization is going on. In other locations, we are accepting the applications in Georgetown. And then on particular dates, we refer the persons to a certain office. And on that date, we turn up with those passports and deliver them. So the situation that we inherited might seem somewhat diminished now. But that is because we have found ways to take the service to the people rather than keeping it in Georgetown. And from since 2017 to now, the crowds that we found at Evlery have all vanished. So that one, from that 1.6 billion, $50,000 have been allocated to building the office, constructing the office at Letem. And as soon as the budget debate concludes, 
um, work would commence in pursuing the, the requisite procurement process leading to the construction of the, of the building. Okay, uh, Minister, um, you said 50,000, that'll be 50 million. Ah, 50 million dollars, yes, 50 million dollars. I, I stand corrected, 50 million dollars. And also, we, uh, you had mentioned the extension of the Stephen Campbell building. Right, now, the Stephen Campbell building is where the Department of Citizenship is housed at the corners of Chandra Paul Drive and um, Charlotte Street on the, let's say, on the northern side of the road, or more, let's say, more towards the northeastern side of, no, northwestern side of the road. Now, that building accommodates the department, but it has found to be inadequate with respect to storage. Two things has contributed to that. One, the number of filing cabinets which the visa section has um, all over the place. And we need to bring them into the location where we are. And secondly, since we are taking over remigration, that section alone has about 25 to 30 cabinets which we need to have with us. Um, one for security, two for convenience of staff. Therefore, it has been, been found necessary to extend that building to provide adequate storage for cabinets. And I can assure you, the cabinets for the visa section might run into hundreds. Mm -hmm. Yes, Minister, but we're talking about filing cabinets and we're talking about documents. There have been steps to digitize this information. How has that process been going? Now, I want to deal with the digitization of the board certificate, which is at GRO, at a different part of this program. But <laughs> your point has much merit because there is active consideration in my mind to um, coming up with a program during the course of this year to digitize all the records. So the immigration and other records, I am contemplating to digitize them. So your question um, goes along a line of thinking that is current and is to be operationalized shortly. Thank you, Minister. Now, as we're still on the issue of immigration and passports, um, it was announced um, recently that a new passport for the six pages will be available. Could you tell us a little bit about that and how that will improve travel, tourism for Guyana, etc.? Well, the 48 page passport um, is an improvement on the 32 page passport and they will run side by side. The 32 page passport will continue to be issued at a cost of $6,000 and all passports to persons I think over 65 would be free. Now, the 64 page passport comes into consideration of the fact that the 32 page passports um, run out of space before five years is completed. And so it is thought that an improved page, I tried to get this 64 page passport, but I don't think the company is mindful of um, producing that passport in, in this region. So I have gone for the 48 page passport so that persons in the category of the judiciary, right, judges, right, you have senior public servants, you have parliamentarians, ministers, who, because of the nature of their job, and you have businessmen too, and some citizens who are frequent travelers, um, would relieve of having to change a passport every two or three years, even before the five years finish. And it is thought that the um, 48 page version would satisfy that demand. Thank you. And printing of passports. Now, you've been given this allocation. How is that process going um, for the new year? Well, we have 
on the 32 page passports, a stock that would last at least up to the end of 2019. In anticipation of the expiration of those passports, we have gone through a process of looking at our consumption rate over the past years. And um, we have come up with a number and we have ordered the supply of those passports from the usual supplier. And um, it is from their estimates that we have been able to approach um, this budgetary period and supply the figure given for the passport which we want to purchase. Now that supply of passports uh, will take into account um, a period of five years. So we wouldn't be required next year to come back to, to Parliament for money. Mm -hmm. We have a total and we would enter into a payment plan and every year we would pay based on the budgetary allocation we have. So once that is passed, we will then proceed year by year on, a, on the payment plan um, instead of paying all the money up front. On the topic of the remigrant system, um, Minister Jordan, in his presentation on November 26, he had mentioned certain systems that will be put in place for that to ensure the smooth running of that process. Now it's been handed over to the Department of Citizenship from Ministry of Foreign Affairs. What are your plans for this specific scheme and how will that run going into 2019? I tell you, we, we, we have to look at legislation and there are other considerations as to uh, types of vehicles um, which persons can bring into the country, then we have to look at how feasible it is for students. Um, is a student a remigrant? Right? Um, and there is a case for students, there is a case for those who are employed in service of Guyana, out of Guyana. Okay, the, 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 there is a case. Let's say they are members of foreign affairs who are some other government agency stationed outside of Guyana for over six years. Can you tell me that they would not have acquired um, items which, for which they would want to bring back on a concessionary rate or some such thing? So all these issues have to be looked at. The student, those who are employed in service of Guyana, outside of Guyana, all those issues we, we, we will address and then the appropriate legislative framework would be addressed to um, ensure that we, we have a regime of rules um, that takes into account the relevant issues in the remigration scheme. Yes, Minister Felix. Now, um, we're moving on to the topic of border management, and more specifically as it relates to the Venezuelans. Um, how do you uh, plan to deal with the influx of the Venezuelans while maintaining strict border management? Well, <laughs> it's not how I plan. It's what we're doing now. And... The issue of border management as it relates to the Venezuelans, we have teamed up with local agencies as well as international agencies. On the international side, we are partnering with UNICEF, the International Organization for Migration, IOM, and the United Nations Office, United Nations Commission on Refugees, right? Um, on the other side, we have the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ministry of Indigenous Peoples Affairs, Ministry of Health, most important, Ministry of Social Protection, Ministry of Communities, but they don't attend now. And um, we have Civil Defense Commission. All these people sit on a committee. We meet twice a month, every other week, every other Monday morning at 11. 
we meet in my office and we address the affairs of the Venezuelan migrants. Now, on the migrant side, we are seriously threatened on the borders we have with Venezuela on Region 1, which is the Mabaruma, Kaituma areas, and Region 7. They are the principal areas. There is some activity in Region 8 and a little in Region 9. But never forget that even before the Venezuelan migrant system became an issue, we had movement, significant movement from Venezuela into the Cayuni area in Region 7 because of the illicit trade in fuel, illicit uh, mining. We had significant movement, and that movement continues and is coupled now with the illegal um, migration of Venezuelans. Then you had illegal movements to Region 2 through charity. They have not gone away, but the current Venezuelan migrant system has added to the challenges we have had and the need for more inf inf greater enforcement and observation. Tell you why. There is a region in Venezuela which is prone to all sorts of communicable diseases. And since the migrant situation has developed, you have Guyanese who are resident in Venezuela returning. You have Guyanese who are resident in Venezuela returning with families and friends. You have the indigenous tribes, the Waro, returning from, not returning, coming from Venezuela. And they are being accommodated by tribes, um, but similar tribes. But there's Waro or other tribes accommodating them in Region 1 and 7. The situation is that the borders are so porous that ordinarily it would be uneconomical to have observation points at certain places because you can cross anywhere and they do it at any time and they have historically been doing it all the time. So for me, the crossings into and out of Guyana through various parts of Region 1 and 7 is not an issue of recent phenomenon. It is an old issue just being capitalized on. So what we do now with Ministry of Health is to investigate, screen, and inoculate persons. And we give support to Ministry of Health by having roaming and immigration officers to spot or to detect or get information as to where Venezuelans are. Take them to the Ministry of Health um, personnel in that area so that they can be vaccinated or their cases can be investigated to determine whether they are, are suffering from any infectious diseases. And that is the nature of the relationship between the, the government departments, particularly the um, immigration department, Ministry of Health, the police. We work together as a team to identify, particularly in Region 1 and Region 7, where the Venezuelans are and to, well, kind of shepherd them to the Ministry of Health. Now, this came about, all this came about um, earlier in 2018. The United Nations Commissioner on Human Rights um, had reached out to territories bordering Venezuela encouraging them to do the following, not to criminalize them, that is, the migrant Venezuelans, to treat them humanely and not to return them to the place of, 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 from which they fled. Now, you will recognize that there would be some contradictions with our existing laws, because our laws would require you to report to the immigration officer our laws would require the immigration officers to give them time to stay. And if they don't arrive in, in, an, in a legal manner, to turn them back. Now, this is where 
we have had to be very flexible, right? And in around April month, we met as um, cabinet ministers led by the Vice President Greenwich, Vice President Ramjitan and myself. We met at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and we came up with a set of procedures which guide us on to this day, right? To achieve exactly what the United Nations Commission Human Rights suggested. So the Department of Citizenship now has gone into a mode of, in, in relation to migrant Venezuelans, for suppressing the laws of Guyana in relation to those persons who arrive without a board certificate, without a passport, without forms of identity, right? We receive them, we record them, and we give them time to stay. Even though they may have come under circumstances that ordinarily would be determined as illegal. Now, and this is where our problem starts. Having received them, some people, some of the uh, migrants will have places to go, some would not have. Particularly, let's talk about uh, a set in the Mabarumi area at Kansil. And that is where we, 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 the work of the Civil Defense Commission is important. They have been providing non-food items like tents, like shov shovels, like um, detergents, etc., and uh, food items. I've seen that distribution. But then the international organizations have come in now to help because we detected that some migrants might be here today, get help, and they're gone there tomorrow and need help or want help. So UNHCR rep on the, um, the committee tried to seek resources, which I think would be here early in the new year. I can't tell you when, but it has been promised. Where they have done a study. Um, I think there's a system called Primes. Um, and through Primes, we have been able to see exactly where the migrants are. Yes, the primes mean population, registration, and identity management. Population, registration, identity management, um, which is an ecosystem database used by UNHCR to document and track um, and services, track and services migrants. So th by this system, we would, able to, we would be able to be advised, or we will get advice as to where the migrants are. They would come in, they would be recorded, and the information on a migrant at, let's say, charity, would be shared with immigration ranks at Mabaruma, right? So that this is an international system used by UNHCR. Their software, their hardware, um, basically, mainly laptops and desktops. Laptops for field work, desktop for office work. So that we would record them wherever they are, if they are a charity, if they are they, they found in, in Region 7, whether it is Ittering Bank or wherever, the details would be recorded there. And if they turn up two months later and you plug the name in, you would recognize that this person was already received at some other port. And so the information would be shared. But we, 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 we have observed a system that says that many of these migrants are not particularly based in Guyana. They go and come. Some of them have their farms in Venezuela, and they travel to Guyana. And they travel from Guyana. So we have a transient lot, and we have a, 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 a set who are prominent here. So far, as I, as I, as all the records, if I may consult the records, the migrants who are in Region 1 and would be estimated 823, with the majority being at 
a place called Blackwater, Kanzil, and Kumako. And you can see Tamaki, 823. And this is between July the 19th and the 15th of November. Obviously, like I said, we have a transit set among them. Then in Region 7, mainly Arau, Kaikan, Puruni, we have another 382. But this is a recently developing area of Region 7. Um, and we have, for the year, total, not, well, no, this is an, another area. Right. We have those who arrived in Region one and two, Bartico seven. We have from April to November 15, 1,744. So we have information from April to now, which encompasses Bartico, which is region seven, Charity, region two, Itteringbang, region seven, Georgetown, and Letem, 1,744. And then we have the, another set. These are migrant um, Venezuela who have been processed. Uh, let me describe this. They are a set who have been processed. Because remember I told you some people come and they don't report, right? So we have been going around and we have been finding them and we have been processing them. That is, put them on the records, get them uh, treated and, and addressed by the Ministry of Health. There are those who do not come, right? Right now, we, we are dealing with that by, we advise some of them that when you're going, you can tell us because there's no prosecution. So some of them have been, have been coming in um, when, when they're leaving. Right, so what I've given you, this 1,744 are those who arrived between April um, 28th and November 50th. This set, the 823 and the 382, the 823 from Region 1, they were processed by Rovan immigration officers. And the set from Region 7, 382, same thing. Okay. Um, now, Minister, with all that you said as it relates to the migrants um, and monitoring them, processing them, do you think we, because this is a question that an ordinary Guyanese would probably want to find out, um, do you think we have the necessary resources, systems in place, in your analysis, to adequately monitor the situation and keep it under control? I tell you what, let us talk about the first part of the of, of the if we have adequate resources. As you could see, the assistance we're getting from UNHCR and IOM and so on. One, they have the facilities where they can go out and do the research and know the areas where the research should be done, right? We, didn't, we don't have that capability, right? But we would develop it having worked with IOM, right? And then we are going to get equipment, right? The equipment and the software to monitor arrivals, department, departures, as well as those who remain in Guyana. And that is extremely useful because when people arrive in your country without records, you don't know who they are. And you need to have a record of such persons. In the event that something untoward develops outside of Guyana, and the person might very well be under another name in Guyana. Right? So all the, this equipment we will get will take into account the need to have biometric data. Right? So you get the biographic data and the biometric data on this. So in that regard, we don't have the, the, the requisite resources. Financially, we do not. But we have been helped with food items supplied by 
UNHCR, IOM, UNICEF, and even the non-food items, the tents, etc. Ministry of Health, Ministry of Health has spent a considerable amount of money. As I can, I can refer to this document here. Unis, uh, my information from um, Ministry of Health in terms of vaccines, they have spent over 14.5 million dollars in all between. Ministry of Health and um, the Department, the Civil Defense Commission. Civil, Civil Defense Commission alone has been able to provide direct and in, in, indirect and direct costs, over $6 million, okay. right? And the vaccines from provided by vaccines and research right, investigation of cases would come up to over $40 million. It's, a, it's, it's very expensive. So fortunately, we get some help from the international agencies, but we still have to come up with some food items, the cost to get the food items into, into the locations. We do get some help from the international agencies. So, Minister, um, thank you very much. It, now, you made your contribution to the budget debate in the National Assembly on Tuesday afternoon, and um, the opposition had raised some concerns as it relates to the documentation of Haitians and in Guyana. Could you, could you explain that for us, and you know, a little bit more? Well, the the, the, <laughs> the situation. The opposition seems to have had a bee in the bonnet on Haitians arriving in the country. Now. At, I think at a recent CARICOM Heads of Government conference, it is clear that the Haitians are to be treated in, as, as members of CARICOM and eligible for treatment along the CARICOM single market and economy. Therefore, they are to be admitted at our ports of entry and granted six months stay, full stop. Now, the problem or the challenges we are facing is that the Haitians would arrive here, enter our ports legally, and I am of the view that some would return to Haiti but there are others who, because of the years of this issue being in, 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 in existence, right, they end up in Suriname en route to Kayan, or some of them leave directly to Kayan. Now, this travel to Kayan is something I'm familiar with. Because in the early 80s, while I was in charge of the airport security, in those days, the BV flights, which is now called Caribbean Airlines, twice a week used to come either Tuesday or Thursday nights, our flights with Haitians. And they went on by Suriname Airlines or Antillian Airlines to Suriname. Apparently, there was a change in the laws in in, or the reaction in Suriname to the arrival of Asians. And so it requires them, the Asians, to get a visa to enter Suriname. And now, it would appear as though there is a relationship between Guyanese, Haitians, Surinamese, uh, those in Kayan to get some Haitians into Kayan. So some people, some Haitians come here and use the backtrack system to either to get into Suriname or to go straight to Kayan. I don't know which one because there's a challenge even for us here as a person who's had responsibility for the 
Bobby's police division at one time, I can tell you that in the, those backtrack days, it was difficult to hold boats coming in or to arrest the illegals coming in and leaving because from number 66 on to um, the, the, where the immigration office is at, 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 well, at Springlands and now at Molson Creek. You have from one to 100 points of departure and arrival, and it is extremely difficult. So just as how it is difficult in the Northwest and in Region 1 and Region 7, block or to the, the, the illegal ports, it's the same thing um, there. And that is what makes it difficult for us to, even Guyanese, to deter illegal departure from Guyana. Sometimes we catch them on the return or they are deported from Suriname. But it is an extremely challenging activity because those who wish to leave can time you and wait until you're stressed out. And then the boats leave or the boats arrive. So it is not that we want to export or to permit free movement of Haitians through Guyana for the purpose of illegally um, entering any other country. We have our challenges here, and we have to put resources into areas where they are our priority areas, rather than just um, trying to run. I, I have run behind it, and I know it's difficult for the current a crop of policemen to, to, to really deal with it. Once the Haitian enters Guyana legally, it's just like you get in a visa, you go to the United States. Unless they find you in illegal circumstances like working, you, you, your, your, your stay in that country is good, right? So. If I leave, if a Haitian leaves Georgetown and goes to the quarantine, you can't say that that trip was for the purpose of illegally departing Guyana for any other country. And I will ask you, it would be illegal to do so. You would be infringing the person's civil liberties as, 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 as persons permitted to stay in Guyana, visitors to Guyana. So, um, it is not an activity we want to get involved in. It would lead us into illegal and unlawful behavior, and we don't want to get involved in it. Okay, now, Minister, on the topic of the challenges associated with uh, the registration of children, birth registration of children, how is the department dealing with that particular issue? Good. Thank you very much. And um, birth registration, by law, is required um, within the first uh, year um, of the birth of the child. After the child, a child is born, um, I think they have a, a short period in which the birth can be registered. After I think it's three months after that, nine months has elapsed, that which would make it one year. You cannot register the child in the ordinary way. You have to then proceed in the late registration mode. Now, that late registration mode is tough. Um, it requires an affidavit. It requires... Um, parents, in some cases, depending on the age of the child, that the child is attending school, etc. Now, these are very trying sometimes for parents. I have undergone situations where the parent is not wrong, but the grandparent is wrong, and the grandparent cannot give the information required. So, late registration for children is a terrible issue, um, and we need to correct it. Furthermore, all the responsibility for the registration of a child's board 
is left to the mother. Right? So, at this point in time, what we are doing is attempting to gain 100% board registration. To achieve this, we have been teaming up with UNICEF in particular has been our main supporter in providing us with funding to visit particularly regions 1, 7, 8, and 9 because the faults in board registration and the challenges in board reg registration exist in greater numbers in those communities. We have gone to, since we have come into government, we have gone to region 1 about four times and we at the end of the year, we do over a thousand births through the system of late registration. That is region one alone. Region seven has its own number, region eight has its own number, region nine has a, a reasonably high number. All the border locations has one peculiar problem, and that problem is that some people go across the border and give birth to their children. And some come back, and upon return, they want the child to be registered in Guyana when the child was born outside of Guyana. Now, we have these little problems now which we have to sort out and which, which we have been discovering and we have to sort out. Then there are some people who leave Guyana they were not registered in Guyana. The boards were not registered in Guyana. They went out of Guyana. And they come back. And they can't remember A, B, C, or D. Then, for them to proceed late registration, the support they need is not there. Because you can ask if a Tusho was in office at the time of your board. The Tusho can say, yes, I know this thing. In one case, I know a lady of 40-something years old, or two siblings, she in Guyana, one sibling in the States, one sibling in the in United States, one in Brazil. Now, she would need to get to them to satisfy us. Because now, with late registration, you are registering a person's birth which did not occur in, in, within your knowledge, within your view, you know, you cannot substantiate it. So you have to get persons to substantiate that this board did occur, how the person says it is, that they were born on this date, to this mother, to this father, and in this particular location. And those challenges are compounded um, with this one-year period, which we observe for normal registration and, 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 and then transition to late registration. So what we're doing now is reviewing the laws and we would be asking very soon for this age of late registration to be extended to 11 years old and that the board certificates of a child between age from birth to like 18 should be free. So that children who have to write exams and so on should not have to go through this trauma of having to do a late registration, right? Sometimes some mothers don't register the child because the father might be unavailable. So they wait for the father's return. The father doesn't come for two, three years, but the child has to get a birth certificate. So by taking it to 11, would give enough time for all these little issues to be sorted out and for the child to get a board certificate. Now it is mandatory that a board be registered because it gives the government a record of the board of the child. It gives the child a nationality, right? It, 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 it gives the child a history of parentage mother, grandmother, grandfather, and so on. So that the child has evidence of birth within Guyana. And that can be used to ensure that the child gets immunized very early and entry into school. 
So we, don't, we, we want to ensure that children are taken care of from birth. Now, so we, we're going to continue in the new year going out to communities and have them um, in a, with a view to identifying those children's births which have not been registered according to law. Then the project we run now at the GRU is to digitize records, that is birth records. We birth, death and marriage records. We have, we have had of the three, three million records to digitize. I am told that we only have another 12% to complete. When the project started to, um, about two years ago, or in 2017 it started, yeah. Um, we had given it three, three years to be completed. We're gonna complete it by August 2020. By August 2020, we would want to start, and we've made provisions in this budget, to print a board certificate. In other words, what we do now is right. And we would be able to access a board certificate record um, in a digitized format. So right now, that process is going on to digitize records. Thereafter, we want to proceed to what the gentleman was indicating to us just now, a unique identity number. Now, every, every Guyanese has a unique ident would have a unique identity number, which would ensure that wherever you go from birth to death, birth, marriage, death, that record must follow you so that from birth, we, we would be able to assign you a number. By age 14, we would be able to incorporate that number into your national ID, etc., etc. And uh, hopefully then we should be able to improve the ID card with barcodes, etc., make it secure, and remove or put the state in a position to identify fraud and repetition, you know. No one person can have two identity numbers. And um, all these problems we were having in the past, um, we expect that the single identity system would be common, commonly used among all departments, government and uh, private, and it should become a very secure um, system of identity. So, Minister, you spoke a lot about um, birth registration protecting the rights of children. Mm -hmm. um, could you elaborate a little bit more on the outreach program that the department had undertaken in Region 1? Well, well it's not just Region 1. And what I could have, I could have given you um, is that we have visited various communities in Region 1. We have visited uh, Mabaruma. We have visited Port Kaituma. We have visited Barometer. We have visited Whitewater. And you would be surprised at the number of children and the number of adults. In 2017, we registered a man in the Kaituma here in Northwest. And the man was all joy, first time in his life over 50 years old that he got a birth certificate. And you, you're meeting several of those. Um, you, the region, and that is one, that is a story from region one. The, every, excuse me, area in region one has issues with birth registration. There was the facility to do bedside registration. Um, but that, I think, fell into disuse. We have had persons in these outlying areas who, who would have been able to work as registrars to register boards. But 
you find that these people too might be challenged because areas that they serve are far flung, right? Some of them, they may have to walk one day, uh, five hours before they reach where they really have to go, even though it's in the same area. And that has hampered the registration system uh, to the point that we still got thousands of persons in these areas who born in Guyana but don't have a board certificate. And, 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 and that is the situation in Region 1. It is the same situation in Region 7, uh, in Region 8 and Region 9. I'm not saying that Georgetown, Regions 4, 5 and 6 don't have them. They have it in smaller numbers, which we can deal with. But I, we need to look at the disadvantaged um, children in the hinterland communities uh, just make sure that they are not denied access to boards. I understand, Minister. Um, no, thank you. No, we're still on the budget. Yeah. Um, Minister Jordan presented a $300.7 billion budget on November 26. We just need some general thoughts from you on the budget and what it entails for Guyana. Well, the, the, the budget, contrary to what the opposition is saying, I mean, the opposition's duty is to oppose, to expose, and to do all, all, all that they are doing. But I have said and I maintain that the attitude of this government is to address human beings and to improve the lives of human beings. We have done work in every community. Minister Jordan budget deals with improvement in roads. Minister Jordan budget has dealt with education. Education, undeniably, is one of the show planks which any country needs to dwell on in order to um, take its development forward. You need skills. The oil and gas industry now needs skills. We can develop these skills by developing our outlook of education. What we are doing now is developing the science and technology. Right? Much of this budget addresses that issue, education, which is development in young people, human beings. We, we look at the, for the second time we are in, in increasing salaries. We have had an earlier salary, in, salary increase, and we, we, we're getting another one. Public servants are getting another salary increase. The teachers have had this. This budget has provided funding for the sugar workers. We said we would have done it in the second half of the year, and we're doing it in this half of the year, right? We have taken the, the income tax in, increased income ta tax threshold, which gives public servants and other employed persons greater spending of their own. And we also have considered the elderly. While in the past the elderly got next to nothing. Since we have come into government, we have moved it from 12.5 now next year it will be $20,500. I think that the budget has addressed most of the real issues which are all of the real issues which we need to be considering um, for people at this time. This uh, for me is a budget um, with development in mind, development which has been lacking um, in the past, and we are going, are uh, proceeding towards it in a manner which would make the community safer, better dealing with the, the, the roads and the traffic situation, dealing with education for our movement forward, 
dealing with the needs of public servants and, and, and workers and, and the elderly. And I think the, the, the budget is deserving of support. Like I said in my presentation, I am taking what I have to do what I want. And um, I think that ought to be the attitude. Um, some other budget, some other time we'll deal with the issues which can be taken up now. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Felix, for joining us on this program where we dealt with uh, the 2019 national budget. And thank you very much, viewers, for joining us. This has been a DPI special program. Thank you very much.